What is at the end of a river or logic system? Where does trout, bats, and salmon migrate to? They all go to the landic systems. For starters, you already know in logic systems that the change mostly occurs lengthwise. Well, logic systems have the most change vertically or on the y-axis. The first location you might think of is a lake or a pond, but there's other habitats such as a reservoir, wetland, rock pool, tree hole, and a bog that can be considered. In the family. For this lesson, let's focus on the lake. There are different kinds of lakes depending on the terrain and temperature, and mixing classifications of them. A bonus for people that stick around to the very end of this video. One example is a crater lake that's formed by a historic volcanic crater. Another is a glacial lake that was formed by glaciers receding and creating holes, depressions in the ground. Another is a kettle lake or potholes, which are like glacial lakes, but smaller and leave behind rocks. The final one is called an oxbow lake that was created by part of a river that has been severely curved and then cut off from it. All of these lakes are not just deep, the funnel, or an inverted cone shape. The third stop is called the littoral zone. That's from the lake's edge until the depth where you can barely see the bottom. This can vary from lake to lake. The littoral zone has three types of plants. Emerging plants, floating plants, and submerged plants. Emerging plants are ordinary plants that are water tolerant. The one that often comes to people's minds are cattails, but they are also wild rice, sedges, tall grasses, arrowhead, American lotus, and phragmites. Floating plants are plants that either have their roots stick out directly under their point leaves or the roots go all the way to the bottom of the lake. These include the duckweed, water lilies, water hyacinth, and water chestnut. Submerged plants are usually hidden from view because they are completely underwater and they don't reach the surface. They include much grass anacaris, hydrilla, bladderwort, and water milfoil. Besides different types of plants, the littoral zone has amphibians, reptiles, and macroinvertebrates. Beyond the submerged plants, we go to the limnetic zone. This can be considered as open water and where you are closest to the deepest part of the lake. The third area of interest to to look at is the benthic zone or the benthos. This is along the bottom of the lake, which is categorized by a low oxygen environment, producing a brown smelly sludge called detritus. Here you can find organisms like snails, worms, and crayfish. Now let's transition from talking about animals and plants, biotic features, to sunlight abiotic features, specifically temperature. You expect things nearer to the sun will get warmer than things farther away, and that's exactly what happens with the water in the lake. This action forms sections or layers in the water called stratification, categorized by their depth and of course temperature. The three stratified layers are called epilimnion, metalimnion, and hypolimnion. The suffix limnion 
has the same root word as limnology, meaning the study of aquatic ecosystems, literally study of lakes. Since the epilimnion is the topmost layer, it would be the worms hovering around there. As for the metalimnion or the middle layer, it has a key feature called the thermocline. This is like a transition zone and acts like a barrier between the other two zones. As a result, it forms this edge or sinuous curve, matching the temperatures at either ends as gradually as possible. Then we go to the deepest layer, which is the hypolimnia. The hypolimnia is the coldest part of the lake with only about 3 to 5 degrees Celsius. Interesting fact, that's why when you jump into a lake to cool off at the summer time, your lower body feels really cold. This leads me to talk about seasonal overtone, simply relating the season's temperatures and weather patterns to the state of the entire lake. Let's start with winter, since it would be easier to visualize with the ice. We all know that ice forms at 0 degrees Celsius, so therefore you can predict that the stratification is inverted, with the coldest temperature on top and the warmest at the bottom. The ice also prevents any huge water movements in the lake. As we transition to spring, the weather becomes warmer, so it will melt the ice. Once it does that, all of the water can freely move again, meaning the less dense warmer water can flow to the top and the denser colder water can sink to the bottom. By summertime, the sun's heat will intensify so that the surface waters become much hotter. This sets up for the formation of the three stratified layers that I mentioned earlier. By the time autumn rolls around, the reverse happens and you will notice the disintegration of the three layers. As the surface waters cool, the metalinion starts to disappear because there will be no imbalance of temperature. The epilimnion will get so cold that it will be colder than the hypolimnion and will sink to the bottom. And the whole seasonal overtone repeat itself as ice forms in winter. The whole thing can take time, being that water is a poor conductor of heat, therefore really hard to lose or gain heat quickly. One way to speed it up is wind. Wind can section off water to either side, creating a temporary barrier. When the weather warms up as from winter to summer, winds can force surface water or the epilimnion to the direction that the wind is going, opening a pocket or a window for the hypolimnion to rise up or up well. Then the two extreme water layers can collide and mix more efficiently. While this is happening, the epilimnion can start to mix with the metalimnion. All of this can create three different circulation patterns, an upwelling zone, the windward zone, and the friction or bleeding through the thermocline. After the wind subsides, this mixing and its temporary barriers will oscillate back and forth like a seesaw until it reaches its equilibrium point or balance state. Side note, this is why the best time to go fishing is either spring or autumn, in part because the oxygen and nutrients will be cycled as well as their layers, becoming more homogeneous. Now for the bonus fact of mixing classifications. In general, there are six different types. Holomictic, monomictic, dimictic, polymictic, meromictic, and emictic, which the suffix 
It means denoting lack of something. Halomitic is the majority of lakes, and it means that they have a uniform temperature and density, or completely mixed from top to bottom at shortened parts of the year. Monomitic are lakes that completely mix only in one period each year. The most well known of these types is the Sea of Galilee in Israel. Dimitic are lakes that mix twice a year. An example is Lake Superior, which is the largest of the Great Lakes in the US. Polymitic are ones that mix frequently due to the fact that the lake is too shallow and unable to form stable stratified layers. These are rarer in nature, but there's one in California called Lake Elsinore. Maromitic are lakes that do not mix. Two of the popular ones are the Great Salt Lakes in Utah and Lake Tanganyika. Lastly, Amitic lakes are ones that frequently or perennially sealed off by ice and only occur naturally in the polar regions of Antarctica and the Arctic, specifically Lake Banda and Lake Bani.